All right. Uh, hello, all. Thank you for coming to the Art Journal Club. Today we have you two talking to us about dynamics. Um, hi, everyone. Help yourselves. <laughs> um, so I had a, uh, I felt a duty to fill in the empty slot of Arc Journal Club in November. Um, didn't really have a good idea what to present. So I just selected a topic that people might uh, not be really familiar with. And I'm also not an expert on this thing. I, I literally studied a lot to prepare the slides on this. Mm -hmm. So it will be a little bit casual and just like get to know uh, like what this term really means and uh, yeah. So it has uh, about 20 slides and half of it will be about very brief uh, introduction to like what MHT is. Uh, and like the rest of the slide, like, about 10 will be about like what Dynamo actually is. All right. So uh, before we go into what MHT really is, we know that like most of the matter in universe exists in the form of plasma, right? So what kind of plasma we have in like ionized fluid in the universe? What kind of objects? So there's stars, sun, um, also like nebula and hot medium and interstellar medium. And they're uh, like not fully ionized, but like at least they're really partially ionized. And they're usually magnetize. We know that magnetic fields are pervasive in this matter. And one another thing characteristic on this thing uh, in terms of electromagnetic fields is that because electric force is usually very, very strong in small scale, um, it usually gets neutralized out really quick. Um, so there's like no very, very strong global fields, but still there can be some uh, short scale, small scale and like short living transient kind of electric field. But like overall, if we take a look at this celestial objects as like a big picture, it's usually like neutral in charge and electric field is like almost zero compared to a uh, magnetic field they have. <clears throat> and I want to introduce there are like mainly three different ways of theories that people study ionized matter. First is called a uh, Vlasov method. This actually tracks down this distribution function f that we have seen in step mac classes. So this is the most accurate method, but it's really hard. So if you like actually look at the equations they solve in this philosophy method, you'll see there's like the evolution of those distribution functions for electrons and ions. Another method is called a uh, two fluid approach. So this basically treats the plasma as two species of fluid overlap with electrons and ions. Um, this has like equations for like separate equations for ion species and electrons as well. But this is not as accurate as the philosophy method, but still does a still does a reasonable job, quoted by Quinn <laughs> on lab plasma. Does the two fluid approach have uh, interactions between the ions and electrons? Yeah. So like if you take a look at that, like the the very last term on the right hand side. I have to move in the electrons. The least accurate method <laughs> is called magnetic hydrodynamics. Uh, people just forget to call this uh, MHD. This basically treat, like destroys this information, well, both ions and electrons, but like treat the fluid as like a single, uh, treat the matter as a single fluid. So this is the least accurate method, but um, it's easier. And if we do not care about greater details and like really high levels of accuracy, MHD does okay job for astrophysics. Um, so there are, uh, because of this complexity of this <laughs> dynamic, there are a lot of memes you can probably find. I think the right one is on um, Nick's opposite door. <laughs> and yeah, let's see why this is so uh, complicated and very hard. Um, so plasma can actually show really different behavior depending on which regime you're looking at. But uh, MHD mostly deals with uh, punchline is plasma should be big and slow. Um, and let me explain, like quantify 
like how will this really interprets to uh, like its physical quantitative scales. So what we say by big plasma is that the length scale we're interested in is like much, much larger than um, something called here lambda D is called the by shielding length. So it's like uh, effectively a length that you will not be able to feel the electric field of that particle over there. So it's like a shielding length, yeah. Here, Rg is a radiation, uh, <laughs> gyration radius. The radius that its uh, ions or electrons are like uh, rotating around magnetic field line. And if your uh, length scale of your interest is much, much bigger than those microscopic scales, um, the assumption big holds. Mm. So you said energy is not exact. Yeah. yeah. Is it like not like in the same sense where we have like you can be like individual water molecules and that's very accurate, but you can treat them as a fluid kind of mm -hmm. so, so are the scales very big in plasma? Like in my understanding is like fluid dynamics works very well for this fluid. Like why do you say that it's an approximation? Okay, what I'm getting at is like the scales in astrophysical systems mm -hmm. are already so large. Mm -hmm. So why is uh, fluid approximation there? Because of course, go ahead. I think you're about to say so. Yeah, so go ahead. Uh, it doesn't say anything about the particle systems. It doesn't say anything about the particle systems. It doesn't say anything about the magnetic field distribution processes and so on. Uh, so there are large scale processes. You have. You have Huge deep field structures and everything, but if you take a turbulence, the energy in the magnetic field dissipates at different scales, at extremely small scales, scale, at inertial scales that, that he has put out over there. And in order to understand how energy is transferred from deep field structures, you need to you need to properly capture these right. small scales, which energy does not exactly. Mm -hmm. So we Okay, so we lose physics, and it's not just about the scales. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's the difference that it's altogether perfect. Kinetic scales are not captured in the fluid uh, approach. Basically. Yeah, it's like <clears throat> hydro hydrodynamic equations. You just don't see like it collision terms one by one, right? Mm -hmm. So those small scales details are like smeared out because we're interested in like this macroscopic thing. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, so big and also assumption related to this is that <clears throat> overall it has charge neutrality and all the species are assumed to be very well mixed. Yeah. I just got an impression that all if you like take actually take a look at those numbers, um it's like not because the small scales are small, but because we're doing astrophysics, L is just like crazy big. It's like one parsec or. <laughs> and, and the other thing is, most of the astrophysical plasma are collision dust systems, which means that the mean free pan and the divide scale mm -hmm. that uh, you just put up here are larger than system scales. So the particles don't even collide once within the system scale, right? So so fluid approach may not be accurate. Uh, for, yeah, for, for some cases. Um... I think I've heard intergalactic matter yeah, fluid, fluid lots breaks, of, breaks down. Lots of cases, mm -hmm. for example, fluid approach is good for, say, well inside of the accretion mm -hmm. dust. You just go beyond the accretion dust, intergalactic scales or the corona of the sun or black holes or anything like that matter. It's all collision dust systems or fluid approach doesn't work. Okay. Um, so that's what we mean by big and what we mean by slow <clears throat> is um, the motion of the fluid. We're dealing, we'll only deal with Newtonian version of MHD today. So fluid motion is non-relativistic. Non and here the time scale of your interest T is like much, much longer than um, microscopic time scales inherently present in uh, plasma. So here uh, omega G is this generation frequency, which particles around the magnetic field, um, omega p is called a uh, plasma frequency. I'll not really uh, go into the details, but this is like another uh, like natural time scale comes with uh, plasma. It's like a collectively minus charge and plus charge like oscillating like this. Yeah. And yeah, if you're trying to resolve some phenomena happening like 
if we resolve like smaller time scale than that, we just can't ignore all this out. Yeah. And it's not perfect, <laughs> but it works pretty well in most astrophysical cases, um, with some uh, exceptions, obviously. So uh, I'll just present some equations and how those assumptions uh, are translated uh, into those equations. So let's start with uh, Maxwell part. Uh, we have four equations, looks like this. I'm using Gaussian unit over here. So here, a big N slope plasma uh, approximation comes in here, ignoring the displacement current. And also we have some like charge neutrality, so we can effectively ignore electric field part. And we'll be using this, uh, how should I say? So originally, like Ohm's law is written in the forms of like J equals some function of E and B. Uh, you can uh, rewrite that into that form. If you like plug in all, the, all these things into a single equation, you get something like this. So you'll see, can you see my cursor? Ah, all right. <laughs> I'll just do it here. Um, you'll see two terms on the right hand side, uh, which describe the time evolution of the magnetic field. First thing, first term is related to, has V, so it's related to the motion of the fluid. Second term, it's not related to the motion of the fluid, but you can see that uh, oh. here, uh, sigma is electrical conductivity. And if you just like drop this term and see this and this, um, this is a diffusion equation we learned in 136A, <laughs> is it right? Yeah. So uh, this term induces a magnetic field to actually diffuse out of the matter. Um, this and this term is like usually called magnetic diffusivity, but uh, what we call it in ideal MHD, we just assume the fluid is like a perfect conductor setting sigma to infinity. So we'll get this. Uh, we'll get this equation for evolution of magnetic field. So we have these two equations from Maxwell part and. I'll skip the derivation, but we get these two equations from um, just regular hydrodynamics. And you will note that uh, without magnetic field, we only have this term over here, and this term is added. So this is like essentially the, the effect of magnetic field has on the motion of the fluid. <clears throat> you can see that fluid motion B couples to evolution of the B field. So fluid affects the evolution of magnetic field. Vice versa, magnetic field also acts on uh, this equation of motion affecting fluid. Okay, so we'll take a look at the consequences of these two differences from uh, ordinary hydrodynamics. First thing is called flux freezing theorem, also called as offense theorem. Uh, this is like one of the actually given as a one exercise in Griffith's ENM book we use for electro, uh, undergrad ENM. So what essentially this is telling us is that, like you don't have to read all of this, but magnetic field lines move with the fluid parcel. So they are uh, anchored or like most commonly called, they're frozen in, in the fluid. So if fluid tries to move, magnetic field also try, magnetic field lines also try to move with the fluid. It's like an easy way to, uh, visualize within your head, like the effect of fluid motion on the magnetic field lines. And here, the effect by uh, this complicated product of cross terms on Euler's equation have can be summarized into two concepts. First is uh, called magnetic sure. pressure. So um, like all this derivation can be found from some textbooks on this using this vector calculus, but I'm just summarizing the results. What this term uh, does is if you have, say, magnetic field lines are more clustered here, um, it exerts pressure to the fluid to reorganize magnetic field with as like equal spacings as possible. So this is called magnetic pressure. Another effect is called magnetic tension. So if you have this uh, magnetic field line bent like this, think of a string uh, with tension. 
and it will try a fluid parcel over here to move uh, like this, like a red arrow. So you can visualize magnetic field lines as some uh, like some string with inherent tension and trying to push each other. Uh, so which are manifest in these pressure and tension effects. So like coupled with already really complicated motion of uh, fluid, this makes MHT horribly hard. <laughs> so uh, I, I got this figure from this website. It's like a really nice summary to just uh, give a sense of what this is doing. So suppose you have plasma over here, uh, have magnetic field. And as we said, magnetic field lines are anchor anchored inside each element. So if plasma tries to move, uh, magnetic field line would bend like this. But as soon as uh, magnetic field lines get bent, as we saw in the slide right before, uh, it will exert magnetic tension force to fluid parts are back. <clears throat> It's kind of interplay between um, just, uh, hydro and magnetic field. All right. Um, I think I'm running a little bit quick, but I can just, I'll just like move to the dynamo part. Any questions so far? This is a really, really short summary of MHT. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Radically short. Okay. Um, so we know Earth has pretty steady magnetic field for now since while well, we survive. But the problem of this with the MHT theory you just covered is that we saw that uh, if the matter has finite conductivity, say the like non-infinite value of sigma over here, then this equation has finite value of this diffusion constant. So magnetic field will uh, be decoupled and just like uh, like diffuse out from the Earth's core. And if you actually compute this diffusion time scale that Earth's magnetic field just diffuses into space, um, we can estimate this number by uh, using like iron. This leads to about three million years, which is much more, like really shorter than the Earth age, uh, obtained by like other geographical methods. So we have a problem here. So some process in, happening inside the earth might be responsible for uh, regenerating magnetic field, uh, even if we have this ohmic decay. And like, this is the problem actually that what's called dynamo tries to explain, like how planets, earth and star have this self-sustained uh, magnetic field like for an anomalously long time. I think it's estimated from you to with like lab lab experiment with molten iron. <laughs> That's what I get. Yeah. <clears throat> right. So first problem we know Earth age is much much older than the magnetic diffusion time scale we get from those estimates. Um, also. There's a question related to this, how uh, the stars have their magnetic fields. And we also see this famous uh, butterfly diagram. It's like sunspots from uh, sun. So we know that sun has, uh, solar activity has this 11 year cycle of like, periodicity, periodicity. So like what is really responsible for driving this? And uh, the theory, the model that is trying to explain all of this is called dynamo theory. And the punchline is there is some internal motions happening inside the celestial body that keeps compensating the magnetic diffusion and regenerating magnetic field over time. So this is the figure that I uh, scrapped from Wikipedia, uh, like a schematic of how this works. So there is some complicated rotation and convecting motion of the fluid inside uh, keeps generating magnetic field, uh, microscopic magnetic field. And a lot of physical processes happen here, like, like convection happens, convections and rotations are uh, playing a role. And just briefly recall what we learned from uh, MHD. Magnetic field lines are anchored in a fluid parcel. 
and it also gives pressure and tension for suspect on the fluid. So uh, let's see. Let me introduce like three different types of dynamo with all these details in your head. First thing is uh, first a uh, branch of studies of dynamo is called kinetic dynamo. This is the easiest one. So you have a pre-specified pre uh, fluid velocity field and just study how does, be, how does magnetic field evolve under this uh, velocity field of the fluid. So this is really easy. Equations are linear. It's a simple eigenvalue problem. So this has been studied a lot uh, in like 20th century. Next thing is called self-excited or depending on the literature called dynamical dynamo. This is the regular dynamo what we uh, usually call. So we solve full MHD equations, say magnetic field acting on the fluid and the fluid get uh, acting on the magnetic field with just solve full uh, consistent MHD equations to simulate this system to get a, a consistent uh, configuration of fluid flow and magnetic field which has like sustained uh, magnitude. So it's, this is in general a nonlinear turbulent problem. It's really hard to do with by uh, your hands. So this usually require uh, some numerical methodologies. The final one, uh, the actual solar and stellar dynamo studies, these are basically doing this self-excited dynamo studies, but find the model that agrees with actual observation. And this is also crazy hard. Yeah. A lot of uh, a lot of actually st studies in this dynamo community that I, I found so far when I was preparing this preparation, they're mostly coming from heliophysical community. <clears throat> so because of all these technical difficulties, uh, it was 1995 that first self-excited dynamo models were presented. So this is the one of the figures that I brought from this uh, paper from Japanese group. Uh, this is another paper presented in the same year from a group in the United States. And what this paper is particularly interesting to me was it actually tried to compute uh, the movement of magnetic pole on uh, on like uh, this map <laughs> in the globe. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it, was, it was kind of surprising to me that this seems a little bit late considering that this is all Newtonian physics, right? And okay. Is the solar guy left one? Either one. Oh, oh uh, this is a this is geodynamo, Earth magnetic field. The one um, on the right is Earth. Yeah. And okay. left. Left is, yeah, I don't think this is solar dynamo. This is, this is like, it's just, uh, yeah. Wait, so what like, characterizes the solar dynamo? It's just like the physics of the sun are complicated or why is it so hard? You mean, um, so you need to explain a lot of things, right? And because we have so much observational evidence is coming from it. Like you need to explain the sunspots, uh, those loops, activities. And also sun is a compressible fluid with differentially rotating profile, right? I see. So it's just like MHD, but really, really hard. And you yeah. you need a lot of accuracy in order to mm -hmm. get the right physics. Is that, is that the case? Yeah. Uh, and oh. also for sun, um, you should note that in that case, gravity also kicks in because like convection uh, is also related to this dynamo process. So, and we, we but are- not entirely sure what's going on underneath the chromosphere. So, mm -hmm. okay, I see. Okay. So yeah. So the point is, the dynamics of the fluid are not even necessarily well modeled. So like, how do you model the like magnetic field or something like this? Well, I think you should model two things at the same time in a reasonable accuracy, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess. I guess I'm just trying to get at like why the solar dynamo is so hard, but it seems like it's because the expectations of modeling it are so high that you can't afford to miss anything, mm -hmm. is what you're saying, maybe. Okay. Uh, all right. And I brought some, I searched for some 
fairly relatively recent studies on uh, Earth dynamic simulations. So they actually predict uh, like this inner state um, also reproduces this polarity reversal, con which conforming with uh, like actual like uh, know, paleomagnetic history <laughs> on the crust. It's actually amazing. Like uh, this simulation is really intricate and geo like geophysics community has like done a lot of work on this. Question. Mm -hmm. Does it get like the frequency of polarity reversals, right? Yep. Oh, that's mm -hmm. crazy. Mm -hmm. So um yeah, there are like a lot a lot of explains that it must conform with like we know that at some point this pole got reversed and we know that like we know by history that like at some period probably the Earth magnetic field has been like got weakened. So they need to match all of these events and correctly explain this periodic speed. So, and they they managed to do it surprisingly. Uh, I think at least tens of million years. Not sure how small their time step is, but. <laughs> I think it was. Yeah, three million years. Yeah. And you know that the like pole actually moves around, right? But um, I've heard that the current state on this community, uh, this community is like they agree on some uh, like observational evidences, like they must explain, but like not all models really agree with each other really well. Okay. Um, and there's some. Why this dynamo is like so complex and hard to study? Uh, there's a related to theoretical concept called anti-dynamo theorems. You actually, uh, you can actually like see the derivation of this theorem from uh, Thorne and Blenford's book. Yeah, so there's a calling that's called Collins anti-dynamo theorem that a purely axisymmetric fluid flow cannot generate, uh, like sustain, cannot sustain a successful dynamo. And there's another theorem of Izelovich that two-dimensional flow cannot make a successful dynamo. So I think there are like a couple of more, but um, basically the, all these theorems is saying that certain types of like simple configuration of magnetic fields, they're just not adequate for uh, dynamo actions. So the real successful, like long lasting dynamos we see in the nature, they just cannot be too simple. And it's very likely that dynamo will fail if they have higher degree of symmetry. Yeah. So this problem is uh, yeah. in, in, inherently so hard to tackle with analytic methods. PD. All right. Uh, and I'll go briefly over two major like mechanisms that people uh, usually cite in, especially in solar dynamo. Uh, so first is called omega effect. So suppose you have a this. Uh, I think people call this poloidal. Um, say like long yeah. Say you have its initial field looks like this, penetrating this flip sphere to plus the direction, and Differential rotation uh, sun, it begins to wind up this magnetic field that looks like this eventually. Yeah. So this is essentially converting this poloidal direction of magnetic field onto uh, this part, uh, horizontal or like toroidal as multiple directions. That's one effect uh, taking place in the sun. And there is a, a thing called alpha effect, which is x the uh x the opposite way. So here, suppose you have a magnetic field like this, like purely toroidal, and a convective motion happening here within a convective layer of the sun basically twists this magnetic field like this and distort the field lines from this like pretty coil shape into this uh, have a lot of like a wiggles developing. So uh, usually it's attributed to uh, Coriolis force acting on this 
going up and down the fluid blobs within the convective layer. And by twisting these field lines, it actually converts uh, the toroidal component back into the poloidal ones and creates this, create this like kink, uh, create uh, like penetrating over the surface. And yeah, I think this is like a popular model for like how sunspot forms here. Yeah. So in summary, we have uh, this omega effect, winding up magnetic field like this, an alpha effect, unwinding this by creating wiggles and turning this magnetic field configuration back. Um, I haven't studied this, but this is like another kind of sort of mechanism that uh, puts this toroidal, toroidal field back into toroidal configuration. So all these things are doing what they do, just keep changing how magnetic field looks like inside the sun. Yeah. And like uh, having this alpha and omega effect at the same time, and people usually call this as alpha omega dynamo, which is actually claimed to exist in, in binary neutron star merger remnant by this recent paper submitted on the archive. Um, FYI, this is the paper that Ellis mentioned in our journal club that did uh, burned like few million hour CPU hours in a single simulations with 25 meter finite difference grid resolution. And they claim that they found, they claim this, that they found this kind of similar alpha omega kind of effect from magnetar remnant by, by merger of two neutron stars to create uh, like strong large scale magnetic field. Oh yeah, so Ellis did similar simulation, but like not exactly resolving this, but uh, I think his paper, he actually put the term induces this alpha omega effect. Yeah. So I think he mentioned, yeah, I, I haven't really like read thoroughly the paper, but he said he mentioned that um, he said he had put it by, by hand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You so just uh, mm -hmm. uh, so we started with this dynamo thing to explain why Earth doesn't lose its magnetic field. The time scale there was a year, a few million years. For Earth, yeah. yeah. Uh, so again, it's sort of time scale. Yeah. Like, neutral star mergers have been reported. Seconds. So like, what is the time scale very different? Right? Like, why are we concerned about that with the time scale? In the binary neutron star, I don't think people worry about uh, like diffusion, but um, how this really amplifies, like how how far this effect can like amplify magnetic field in the remnant. Right? Do you have certain BP strength to produce jets that are even shorting at least the rest of the and uh, these BPs have to be coherent, 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 strong. And not sure if just merging two neutron stars can use them without mm -hmm. some dynamo magic. They amplify this wide Uh and also to get to achieve map stars, mm -hmm. it's we need to have some other dynamo action that uh, amplify these dynamics. So dynamo is not just about sustaining it, also like amplifies when we Yeah. So yeah. uh I mean you mean like this, so we have Pre at this merger phase, there is uh, amplification by Kevin Holloman's instability at the interface, right? Mm -hmm. So you're saying that that's like not enough for explaining like miniature jets. Like I I don't, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if PHA alone can provide you with large coherent quadrants. Yeah. To produce jets. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> But yeah, okay. Uh, I'm not sure. mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, this, this simulation was like resolution was super high to capture how initially dynamo is driven at the remnant. So they had to resolve a uh, magnetic rotational instability, which drives the dynamo in the first place. And I'm not sure Alice mentioned this or not, but some of this. Thing didn't show really show conversions. <laughs> so, yeah. 
that's something you know, that you can do with uh, spending all the allocation within a single simulation. <laughs> I'm surprised like given how inaccurate numerical like neutral star collisions are already like how do you convince someone to spend like so many hours on doing something that sits on top of it? It's like it's your under underlying neutral star collision even correct. Well, like you know, matter simulation is not not at the not even at the stage of discussing convergence yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure like they use some like the underlying neutral stars, they must have taken some inner simulation. And then overlapped oh, everything on top of the other how they how they did the whole thing. How they, they did the whole thing? Like did they have like two grids actually like simulated the whole neutral star? Oh yeah. Oh, so so you see here uh like different colors of curves, right? So they, they perform like the most expensive part, like the merger, the the most violent stage with high screen resolution. And I think as this remnant settles down, they gradually uh, increase grid spacing. Yeah. But they didn't have like, I wouldn't think they have two different like meshes for simulating different mm -hmm. physics. It's all still just the main mm -hmm. Do they have all GR in this paper? Yes. No. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm not sure if they had neutrino or not. But, yeah. I think I think they did have neutrinos. If, mm -hmm. Well, maybe it's not the same simulation, but I assume they did. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I heard that some people from EAC actually did not do with Chinese simulations. Um. All right, these are uh, what I have prepared so far. So I need more questions. Uh, what do neutrinos have to do with this? I think you mentioned neutrinos at the end. Oh, just like in general in binary neutron star merger? This is it just like a general thing that they care about for some reason? It's a huge thing that we should probably okay. Yeah, it can, uh, it can change the answer. Yeah. Qualitatively. Yeah. Oh, change. Like, Qualitatively, it really changed the answer. How long a neutron star remnant lives, and whether or not jets or any stuff can all be <clears throat> changed by oh. the neutrinos and how they oscillate and the, the flux of neutrinos can have. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. I think also like neutrinos carry even more strong data than to you. Like neutrons doing supernova? It's supernova, yeah. Oh, okay. 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 Mm -hmm. That's right. Is that right, Isaac? <laughs> Wait, I couldn't hear the last thing. <laughs> what, what, what was that? No, I'm just saying, like, in supernova, like, I think Mike told us that neutrinos actually carry away most of the energy. Like, yeah, yeah, that's like, true. I mean, so if, you're, if your neutrinos are like 10 MeV, I mean, in a supernova, like, each each baryon, mm -hmm. like, launches like 10 neutrinos at 10, about 10 MeV each. So, Something like ten percent, like that's a hundred MeV total. So they're these things are losing like ten percent of their rest mass to neutrinos. So if you don't model that, you like, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of energy that just sticks around that shouldn't be sticking around. Uh, it also gives viscosity to the fluids, so it's really important to resolve those effects. But those are so just computationally so expensive, so it's really hard to do like full neutrino. Yeah. Yeah, so can you go to your the slide that compares the oh, oh Nick also has a question. Can you go to the slide like one of your earliest slides that compares the different strategies for evolving plasmas? So in the MHD approach, you don't care about the masses of the individual particles, right? Yep. Oh, you also don't care. Do you care about them in the two fluid approach, or is it just the ratio that matters? Sorry, sorry, what? Do you care about the masses of the... So you certainly care about the masses of the particles in, in like, if you're actually tracking the distribution function, right? Or, like, I, then you have to care about that. But in the two-fluid approach, like, does the mass of the particle actually... I mean, so it clearly enters the equation, but is it is it important that you know the masses of these particles, or is it just the mass ratio that matters in in this type of 
Mm. Like, and well, I'll get maybe the question then is like, why doesn't the mass of the particle enter in regular MHC? <laughs> oh, the mass of its particles? So, yeah. uh, so if you look at this hydro part here, variable rho. Yeah. That's all the weighted sum of uh, like particle number density times mass. So these are some of ions, electrons, and also neutral particles. Yeah, I see. You can actually write continuity equation and uh, this equation of motion for all different species of particles. And you all did like sum and do some complex not very complicated algebra, you can actually see that the equation reduces to this form. Yeah. So yeah, okay. So the, yeah, so MHD is kind of magic in that sense, right? Because it it's basically, a, regardless uh, of the charge carrier, uh, no. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's I know, some sort of fraud. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah, like this, this like single velocity variable V it's like not capturing uh like relatively different velocity between electrons on uh, ions, like right? you know, there is a distribution would be right. And that that's different. Yeah. Even though it's still a fluid. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I guess. Uh, I think Nicholas said, "What is the mean free path of neutrinos in this kind of system?" Uh, sorry, I don't know, but <laughs> it depends on where you are. I yeah, mean, yeah, basically. Yes. In the interior, it's they're all trapped, right? And and I think it's just like very small, like the spacing between baryons or something. But oh yeah, uh, uh, Eli. Also, why people care about neutrinos is that they actually change the composition of the matter. They change the relative ratio of neutrons and electrons in the matter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it by some kind of nuclear reaction. So. Yeah, it's like non-nuclear, but yeah, the, uh, better the case. Yeah. Uh, all right, yeah. Nick gave comments on maybe she does not know about microphysics and neutral conductive fluid. Yeah. Nick, do you want to put the 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 meme on the left on your door, <laughs> please? <laughs> Or I can put it in our, in, 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 in our door. <laughs> this is still like just Dragon Ball Z. It is not a. It's not anything more special. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm just trying to figure out like people who haven't watched like can they delete this? <laughs> okay. Um. Any more questions for Yunsu? Oh, actually, I have one. On slide six. Um. It's oh. like. Yeah. It's like the V over C trick. That's like a relativistic effect. V over C and cross V. Or, so I thought uh, there's a C in there, so it seems mm -hmm. like relativistic, but I thought like we were not considering. Uh, I'm not sure what to answer because Maxwell equations is they're consistent with special relativity. So Yeah, I guess it makes sense. Is it just that that V over C trick is small? No, 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 yeah, just like first order effect cannot be a thing with it. Yeah, it's usually a Um, this is more related to the, to the fact that let's say you can, if you move to the rest frame of the fluid, electric field becomes zero. Mm -hmm. That's what, like, what this is trying to uh, tell. Yeah, yeah I vaguely recall. This kind of like equivalency of E and D from like, you know, class, but it's been a while. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, th this is kind of disturbing though, right? Because is is there actually a consistent theory of non-relativistic MHD? No, <laughs> I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And Elias also once said, pointed out to me that this arms law does not respect causality. Mm -hmm. So yeah. It's like so in the in the fluid rest frame, that like just ignore magnetic field for now. It's like we normally learn Ohm's law in forms of like J equals sigma e, say like in, in this like wire or whatever. Um, I think what we talked was that's basically telling you that the change of field, this matter instantaneously reacts to the change of the electric field. 
which should like actually take some finite time to reorganize itself to react. So I think he has done some work on that, but it was too hard to understand. <laughs> I bet there's a like a faculty just dedicated to doing that kind of extended theory uh, at U of I. Not sure you have met him, but no. <laughs> All right. There are no more questions. Let's thank you. I missed slides today.